Greetings, friends. My name is Jason Charnick, and welcome to Episode 5 of Head Above Water, a podcast about filmmaking and mental health and what it takes to find a little peace and happiness in this crazy, topsy-turvy business called show. In this week's episode, we have a very special guest. We're going to be speaking with writer, director, producer, and actor Numa Perrier from the feature film Jezebel. Jezebel had its world premiere at South by Southwest this year in the very same theater as my film Getting Over premiered at the year before, the Alamo Ritz in Austin, Texas. And Jezebel will also be premiering on Netflix on Thursday, January 16th, as well as in select cities theatrically. Check your local listings. If you can see this movie in the theaters, I recommend that you do. And if it's not playing near you, definitely check it out on Netflix on Thursday, January 16th. I was very honored to do a Q&A for this movie at South by Southwest this year, and I was really, really impressed by it. And I'm really, really excited to dive into our conversation with Numa. But before we do, I just wanted to let you guys know some very good news. We are going to be going weekly. That's right. We used to be a bi-weekly show. We're going to go weekly. We're going to break up our interviews into two parts so you guys have fresh content every week. We're going to start adding some bonus content too, some filmmaking stuff for the filmmakers out there, and maybe some other things as well. We're kicking around some ideas. So get in touch. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you like the weekly format that we're going to be moving to. It'll make the shows a little bit shorter, a little bit easier to listen to, and uh, keep some fresh content coming for you guys every week. So stay tuned for more weekly episodes of Head Above Water. As we get ready to dive into our conversation with Numa Perrier, we talk about some really, really cool things this week. We talk about not only what it's like to have your world premiere of your first ever feature film at South by Southwest, but the whole can of worms, the whole can of anxiety worms that that opens up because it's not necessarily, you know, an instant ticket to happiness. So we talk a little bit about that. And we also talk about Jezebel is a semi-autobiographical picture about Numa's life, just like my movie is an autobiographical picture about my life and my father's life. And we really have a good, deep, in-depth conversation about the fear and the angst that comes with putting your life story out for a world audience where it can be interpreted and accepted in any number of ways and the anxiety that that can cause in in a young filmmaker and we'll have the second part of that interview coming for you one week from today again don't forget all of this music that you're hearing today is brought to you by the fantastic jason david white check him out at soundcloud.com slash jason david white and yeah without further ado here's part one of our interview with numa perrier All right, we are here with Numa Perrier, director of the film Jezebel, which world premiered world premiere at South by Southwest yes, this year. Was that the world premiere? Yes, that was our world premiere at South by. Oh, that's fantastic. My film Getting Over premiered in the same theater as you guys at last year's festival, the Alamo Ritz, on the same day. So I feel a very deep affinity for you guys and you and your project and the film and everything about it. And I'm just really excited to talk to you about it today. Oh, thank you. Uh, It is a beautiful theater and South by is a great festival to open at. Just the way I discovered it was really exciting for me. I went back to the festival this year as an alumni to do an alumni Q&A, and I wasn't there for the premiere. I think you had had, I think it was the second or third screening, and it's what they call a buzz screening. So obviously you guys were getting some buzz going. And obviously people were talking about it. So they scheduled this third screening and it was at the Zach Theater in Austin. And it was really fun for me because when you go in as an alumni for a Q&A, they give you these little cards, this little four by six, and it says buzz screening on it. And you don't even know what you're doing or what title you're seeing or anything like that. And they give you these sample questions. Like what led you to making this film? What were the biggest challenges you faced? And when I do Q&As, I, I want to go a little bit deeper. And when I first found out what the film was and like I said I didn't even know anything about it so I'm sitting in the audience thinking I want to connect with this film I you know I want to be able to ask some good questions afterwards and I want to see what it's all about and it's about the character Tiffany who loses her mother at age 19 and I lost my mother at age 23 so I was instantly before the film even really got started you know before it even started to unfold I was like wow as soon as I saw that the lead character had lost their mother at an early age I was instantly just like pulled right into it, like straight away. It immediately spoke to me and the audience absolutely loved it. And the Zach theater has to have a few hundred seats. It's a huge theater and it was jam packed. It was just a real, 
you know, I know you weren't there for the screening, unfortunately, but it was jam packed and it was one hell of experience and we had a great lively Q and a, and it was a really good time. So just to ask you a little bit about premiering at South by Southwest, I was actually going back in and, and researching and, you know, when I was getting ready to talk to you, I didn't even realize it at the time. I had assumed that the film was in the narrative competition, but it was actually in the visions category. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about that and see if you had any specific thoughts about what it means to be in the visions category and what that means to you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, um, I was really sorry to miss the, uh, the buzz screening as well. I actually, um, got what I call the festival flu. <laughs> it, it, it's a whirlwind. It, it is definitely a whirlwind. It, it's yeah, you're going nonstop, and there's a, you know, it's between films and panels. You're drinking, and you're <laughs> partying. And it's like uh, your immune system is not at the greatest with all of those things combined. So I got hit really hard. Like I, I woke up that morning and uh, went straight to <laughs> a CVS and got like Nyquil and. <laughs> <laughs> and orange juice, doctoring myself. So it was great because we had the whole Jezebel team there and a, a lot of us were able to stay for the majority of the festival. So the film was still represented. You know, Tiffany was there and our fourth screening because the, uh, they had already given us three. So the buzz screening was our fourth. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. Double, double buzz. It was such an incredible, overwhelming in the best way response that you could ever hope for when you first launch your film out into the world is to have it so enthusiastically received. And uh, uh, Janet Pearson, the head programmer at South By, actually took me aside and said, you know what, we underestimated your film. Wow. <laughs> you know, oh as far as God. attendance goes, you know, she's like, we underestimated it. And she didn't say, oh, you know, maybe we should have put it in the narrative competition. She didn't go as far to say that, but the conversation was kind of just around wow uh, yes we love your film that's why we programmed it yeah. but it also really took us by surprise <laughs> and I really just took that as, as a big compliment you know and we laughed about it and I would rather you know exceed expectations than disappoint uh, even myself so I was fine with it and just getting into South by knowing that like 3,000 they get like 3,000 films <laughs> entered and it grows every year just to get that call that you got in was already <laughs> such a huge deal. And I was in so much shock and disbelief for about a week that it wasn't, it didn't hinge on being in competition. And also the vision category, I feel is a really special, distinctive yeah. category that's recognizing filmmakers and films that are moving kind of outside linear paths. And South by Southwest in general leans towards those type of films. Sure. But I think when it comes to their competitive category, it's a little more commercial based, but still with that South by flair. Exactly. So I actually felt really honored and acknowledgement of kind of my artistic roots in the experimental space and in the art house space. And it set us up <laughs> to have more success in a way. <laughs> so you didn't, there wasn't any real, any disappointment or anything. Cause when I was in, when, when we were in the documentary spotlight category and listen, I, I wasn't expecting to get into South by Southwest at all. I mean, like, you're right. They get 3000 submissions every year and every year is, you know, a new record for them for submissions. So that's kind of why I wanted to ask you about the visions category, because it is a very special category, but there is, you know, at least for me, and that's why I'm always curious to speak to other filmmakers and directors about it. Cause there was an initial, you know, I was running around my, my house in my underwear, like literally just like screaming like a banshee. But then when I found out we were, in the spotlight, I was like, well, why are we not in the competition? So there's always a little bit of like the grass is greener on the other side, but you sound like you feel totally comfortable and pleased that that's the space that they found for you. Well, here's the thing. Uh, I definitely was running around screaming. I was actually <laughs> stunned and in disbelief for, I, I, it was actually an amazing feeling because how often do you really get true surprises in your life? It was a total surprise because I had just kind of, I was already making plans on how to figure out how to just kind of like 
self-distribute my film. Sure. I didn't know where it was going to land. When I was tired of waiting um, <laughs> on figuring out where it was going to go. So when I clicked into my Gmail and saw that e- email too, sure. I was really stunned. And I called Tiffany and we were both stunned and then like crying on FaceTime together. It was emotional. No, you know? Beautiful. So there was really like no sense of disappointment. But what I will say is that I am competitive by nature. I'm competitive as an artist. I'm competitive in all aspects. I'm I'm an ambitious woman, and that is part of how I create as well. So those type of feelings of kind of disappointment of not being in the competition came up more in the middle of the festival when we were being received so well. (laughs) And you feel like, oh, wow, you know, if we had been in competition and also hearing it from Janet herself like how much bigger would it have gone but really you know like when you go to the award ceremony you want to win something <laughs> and <laughs> that's why they tell us that's why they tell us to always yeah. vote for the oh, vote for the audience exactly <laughs> it's like you're being invited to the award ceremony and you're like but i'm definitely not gonna win <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, we, i had a blast with it i mean at, at least you know I, I knew we weren't gonna win so at least i wasn't on the edge of my seat waiting for anything you know waiting for that validation yeah, well, they had a couple of awards outside of the competitive category. They had one for like emerging, like first time woman filmmaker stuff. So they were like, you got to make sure that you're at the awards ceremony. So, you know, if those events are kind of set up for anyone who has even a shred of competitive nature in them, right. it's going to start feeling that adrenaline rush, you know, so that that would be the only time that any kind of disappointment came over us. But we could quickly wiped that away because again the film was so well received that was really the main thing to focus on is that we were taking off no matter what That's great. When did you first find out that it was starting to get up some buzz? Because when you're world premiering at South by Southwest, that first screening is always going to be a little big and bustling and sold out and everyone's going to be excited. When did you first start to get the hint that like, hey, this is actually doing a little bit better than we thought. Was it just when Janet pulled you to the side and it came out of the blue or did somebody else? After our first screening, because they can already tell what the numbers look like for your next screenings. And mm-hmm. she, you know, as you know, the head of the festival, she hears everything from everyone. So right. she let me know that she would, how much she was hearing. And even before our premiere, when we had our first orientation, she and Claudette, uh, Claudette's another programmer also already said that there was already kind of like pre buzz for the film, you know? And so they do a lot of early promotion leading up and they, they can just tell what's getting hits. Like they do interviews with, as you know, you know, with all the directors and they, you, they, you can feel it coming, you know, it's not, it's never just out of nowhere, but it does start to swell when we were talking about it already in a really intimate way. And we were uh, letting people know what we were doing. We didn't just all of a sudden start telling people go see Mm -hmm. our movie because it got into South by, we were already treating it in that way. So I think, you know, all of those things lead to building that kind of anticipation. Let me ask you a little bit about the movie then, which is a little bit about your life. So it is semi-autobiographical. I know not everything in the film is exactly how it, how, how it happened in your life, but you did lose your mother when you were young, like I said, as did I. And when I was doing research and as the months have been going by and seeing you talk about the film and talk about your influences and your experiences and things like that. One thing that really stood out to me was that you've mentioned on multiple occasions that you kind of grew up in maybe not an artless household, but in an environment where your creativity wasn't really encouraged. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you discovered your creativity, your creative voice. You hear a lot of stories about filmmakers like Steven Spielberg or whoever, they grow up and they're all about the movies and they have their parents' camcorder and they shoot their own movies and they make their own movies as little kids and go out and have fun. And I I didn't grow up in an environment like that at all. You know, and researching you online and everything that's going on and hearing about how you kind of grew up in a similar experience. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it was like to discover your creativity and your creative voice 
And what kind of unlocked that door for you, if you will? Yeah, well, it sounds like you definitely had to deal with a lot of really tough circumstances growing up. And I think it's definitely something that I can relate to. And that's the that's very striking, you know, um, that you're talking about that. For me, I, yeah, I would definitely say similar, <laughs> similar experience in that, you know, my parents were not artists um, and did not know anything about like how to nurture an artist. And so there was just no awareness of what that was. So my sister growing up could, was a visual artist and could draw, you know, had a really great talent for drawing and painting. And that was something that was acknowledged in the family that she had this talent, but there wasn't a lot of space for what to do with that. Like she wanted to go to an art institute and there just wasn't any in the small towns we lived in, there wasn't a lot of exposure or opportunity for that. And our family didn't have a lot of money. Like, you know, we were pretty poor. So there was just no extracurricular activities. That's something I'm still getting used to is like, oh, like when kids grow up, they actually take lessons and do things. That's not something we ever did, you know? And those are ways that you nurture talents or that you might discover a talent. And so I looked at her and I saw my sister as an artist and the things that I was interested in, which was acting and writing and eventually photography, the acting and writing part, I didn't see that as art. Sure. I didn't know that that was under the umbrella of an artist. I thought, you know, an artist is kind of only has this visual expression. So all of those things I kind of had to learn and discover slowly over time. And a lot of it really didn't become apparent to me until I was a young adult. So. Everything that I was doing was just a form of play sure. to me. How I had fun with, you know, I would make up stories and write stories for fun, for my the own pleasure of doing it. And I uh, would, would have never put that under the category of an artist and didn't see a career path with it, except for with the acting, because I could see on TV that there were people doing this thing called acting, That's right. <laughs> you know, and that that was a career. And I was always trying to solve that puzzle. Like, well, how do I get there? You know? But yeah, there was really no support, no no nurturing around that. No creative auntie or uncle that took me under their wing, you know, nothing. (laughs) So do you find then that, well, just like you said, like it strikes me as, you know, right to the core, because like I said, I didn't grow up in an environment that kind of encouraged that. But my uncle, my father's brother, he was a muralist. He still paints murals. And that was always my idea of an artist growing up, you know, like a painter, just for some reason in my own mind, if you're a painter and you make paintings, you you're, you're Van Gogh, you're an artist. Right. It took me a long time to come to the realization that I am an artist myself as well as a filmmaker. And even to this day, even talking to you right now, I see you as an artist. You're, you're clearly an artist. The way you create on screen is amazing. So it's still hard for me to come to the realization that I too am an artist. So do you feel that even though you've discovered your creativity and your creative voice and you found an outlet for it that works for you, do you still find that it's hard for you to kind of come to the realization that you yourself are an artist as well? No, not anymore. But initially. I I know who I am. I understand my childhood. I understand why I didn't know that before. I still marvel at that, but I definitely know that I'm an artist now, and it's such a good feeling (laughs) to know that, you know, to, I have no doubt. I feel like it's one of the only things that no one can take away from me is that I know that about myself. Oh, that's fantastic. And I assume it took you, it took you a while to get there as well, but it sounds like, so you would look back on your life and your life experiences and be like, well, this is what made me who I am today. And yes, this is what makes me an artist. And yes, I am an artist. Yes, absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's talk about the movie a little bit. So again, with Jezebel being such a from the heart autobiographical story, did you have any particular fears involved with being so open on screen? I mean, there's topics in there. It's about sex workers and things like that. And that's not the easiest topic for people to talk about. They get very uncomfortable around sex. So did you have any specific fears or anything holding you back or 
what were your feelings when you realized that you were putting your whole life out there for the whole world to see? Oh, yeah. I had I had a lot of uh, fear <laughs> around it and nervousness and kind of the whole spectrum of <laughs> the fear palette, <laughs> you know, apprehension about it, a hesitation, procrastination, all of that. And it really took time and support from others to help get me over that hump. And then at some point I had to just also like (laughs) jump over several, you know, jump off of several different cliffs along the way. It it took time because it is my true story. So that's a, that's a certain level of exposure that I had not explored before. I definitely made uh, short films that were slices of my true life. And I had talked about my work in that way before. But this particular part of my life, I had not talked about before, not even with my sister, who was there (laughs) and who the movie was about, who influenced me greatly. You know, once I left Las Vegas and she left Las Vegas, neither one of us talked about her being a phone sex worker and me being an early cam girl. Uh, We never talked about that again for years until I decided to make the film. Oh, wow. That long, huh? And there was a lot of just hiding it and tucking it away and thinking that it had no relevance to my life as an actress. It had, if anything, it was something that would hurt me, that it had no relevance to my life in any relationship, that if anything, giving that information would make someone not want to be with me or, you know, hesitate to be close to me. So it was something that I kept as a secret for the most part, you know, very few people knew about it and whoever knew about it, it wasn't something that I talked about. The contrast of that is, and it's you know shown in the movie is that it wasn't because it was such a horrible thing or such a horrible experience it was because i understood very well i think as most people who have done sex work or are doing sex work know we are aware of the stigma attached to that. And so it's not so much a reflection of our experience, though there are some bad experiences within it. It's not so much a, the secrecy around it is not so much about that as it is the stigma, the, the, you know, of not being part of the status quo, you know? So that's the thing that kind of silences you and that I allow to silence me, even though in the back of my mind, my instincts told me that one day this would make a good movie possibly. At the time, I was not thinking that I would direct it. (laughs) I was, I just, I didn't know how it would ever come to be. It took me a while to finally start writing. And when I did, I stopped at 15 pages and I put the script away to never revisit it for another few years, you know? So I have God knows how many unfinished <laughs> scripts yeah. sitting on my computer that like that are 20 years old, but you'll come back to it someday. Yeah. It was a lot of starting and stopping. And I, you know, you know, as you just said, like that's pretty normal for a writer, <laughs> yeah. pretty normal for a creator. And so I was definitely creating a lot of other work in between. So I was always in production in some stage of production pretty much my entire career but (laughs) this had an extra layer of it being so personal and and again just knowing how people treat sex workers you know or Mm -hmm. people treat anybody who does any type of anything you know that is like that is viewed as you know risque or (laughs) something that that they wouldn't have the courage to do, you know, that they look down on. But they all have the courage to consume it, but right. they don't have the courage to, you know, I'm no prude, we all consume it, but nobody wants to talk about it and stuff like that. And the reviews that I've read about the film have all been very glowing. You know, I haven't really seen anything that's kind of negative about the film, but have you received any criticism about the movie or, you know, not anything that makes you regret what you've done because it doesn't sound like you regret it at all and you should be absolutely proud of it. But has anyone, have you read any criticism where you're like, I don't know, just to link it up, because I do feel like we have a, we, we have so much in common. But with my movie being autobiographical as well and being about my father and his drug addiction, you know, and I've read some negative reviews about it and it's very low budget. It doesn't look that hot. We shot it on video and this, that and the other. And whenever somebody criticizes it, 
You know, I'm like, that. that's my life, man. <laughs> yeah. that's, you know, I've made other movies where it's like, I don't give a shit if you liked it or not, but this is my life. You're not just ripping my movie. You're ri- kind of ripping me. You're ripping my father. You're ripping my life. So have you heard any criticism? Has there been any backlash that kind of upsets you because it, so personal a film and you kind of take that a little bit more personally oh, well yeah of course um there have been a couple of reviews that were that were not glowing like smaller blogs um but, you know <laughs> but people with real opinions of, of, about the about the film and i think you know when you have more good reviews than bad and more specifically good reviews because sometimes people can kind of give you a general good review and it's not also not that great, but to have really people very specifically drill in on what they love about the movie and, and have that positive critique helps whenever you get a ping <laughs> or, you know, a little you know negative critique inside of a more positive review. It's like, of course, you're, you're always going to feel that. And, and that's happened. But, you know, for the most part, I think that Any criticism of the film, whether it's about my actual filmmaking style, whether it's about, you know, the budget of the film or, you know, the quality of the film, all of that is really pale in comparison to how hard it's hitting people emotionally. So I'm able to really shoulder that because I know that it's impinging people and I stand by the work that I did. So I, when I read something like that, I can actually see the truth in what they're saying and why it didn't work for them or why those things bothered them. But I'm so proud of the film. It's everything that I want it to be. And I have a confidence about it that even if someone says something that I feel is true, (laughs) that's negative, I can go, yeah, that's true. But the the movie for me is still great and I wouldn't change anything. I'm happy that I feel that way. But, you know, the first time that you read something negative about any work that you do, it's going to hit you and you're going to feel like, okay, are more negative reviews coming is my work about to really get panned (laughs) right right. and being in south by southwest doesn't necessarily take away you know that angst that anxiety oh not at all as a matter of fact you deal with new anxieties because you know how it is it's like as soon as you go to south by it sets a bar that you feel like you have to hit throughout the rest of the circuit yeah like the next level once you go to south by or go to sundance or go to any major festival is what is your first big review going to be like And I remember we knew that the Hollywood Reporter was going to review the film and they told me who was going the who was going to review it. And I looked up the guy's other reviews (laughs) and I doing recon on you, bud. Yeah, I looked up his other reviews just to get like a sense of like what his deal is. And I saw that sometimes he's been very hard on. He, he reviews for theater and films and that sometimes I've seen him rip a production to shreds and I've seen him and I've seen him give good reviews too. So that made me scared, but it also made me happy because I said, well, whatever he says, it's going to be honest. It's not, he's like a real critic. <laughs> he's right. like, he's like an old school. I review plays. I review movies. I've been doing this for a while type of critic. <laughs> it's not a, it's not a two liner anonymous review on Amazon prime. Yeah. And it's not a synopsis of the story. Like, you know, that right. he's going to actually truly review your film, not just kind of, you know, there's different levels. So mm-hmm. I was nervous about it, but I was also like, well, whatever gets said, at least I know that it's not going to be anything that's pandering or someone who doesn't really know like the art of reviewing (laughs) so when the review came out I remember I was with Tiffany we were having lunch at South by and I got the email came through and I just like took a breath I read it to myself first before I would (laughs) she was sitting across from me watching my face (laughs) and as I was reading it, I go, okay, it's good. I, okay, it's good. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and then I started and reading breathe. it out loud. And it was a, a really, it was, you know, he really loved the film. And we, we both just celebrated that, you know, but it could have gone either way. You know what right. I mean? You just never know. 
And there you have it, part one of our conversation with Numa Perrier. Join us one week from today, seven days, for part two of our interview with Numa. And until then, if you like the show, please leave a rating or review on whatever platform you're listening on. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. We're on all the big ones, Google Play. So whatever you're listening to us on right now, please leave us a rating. Please leave us a review. I'd love to hear from you guys. I'd love to hear what you like about the show, what you don't like about the show, who you'd like us to talk to, and just basically anything that you might have on your mind. We're an open book here. So drop us a line. Let us know what you think. And we will see you one week from today for part two of our interview with Numa Perrier. Thanks a lot. We'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.